Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me tonight for our Wednesday night Bible class. I'm so glad that you are logging on tonight to hear what the Lord is saying to the church. I want you to do this for me. Would you take a moment and to share or start a watch party or like this video? We enjoy having an interactive relationship with you when we're doing Bible class. And yes, I am here at the church uh, ministering God's word for you. So I want you to uh, just take a moment, take a moment and share uh, this this page, this video, with someone that may be blessed by God's word on tonight. I believe that I'm going to say something that's going to uh, help you in your walk with God. It's going to radically change someone's thinking. And so I'm confident of that. And so I want you to take this few moments as I get ready to get started to just uh, push your like button, push your share button, uh, share with everybody that you know, your friends, uh, your co-workers, your family members, and let them know we're just about to get into God's word, all right? I'm so glad that you're here on tonight. Listen, I wanna jump right into the word of God on tonight. I'm gonna to be talking to you tonight about connecting with your gift. Connecting with your gift. I wanna to talk to you tonight about how God can use creativity to bring about your spiritual growth and development. How God can use your gift to not only bless you, but bless the people that you have to do with, bless the world. I believe that the graveyard is full of people who have died with latent gifts, latent abilities, that God wanted to bring out while they were alive in this world. And so I wanna show you tonight, or just touch on a little bit tonight, how God can use your gifts to spark creativity in your life, right? So I wanna talk about connecting with your gift. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 21 with me. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 29. In the New King James Version, it says this. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Uh, the word excel there means uh, to be skillful, to be, Ill to be diligent. It means to exceed. It means to be exceptionally good and to surpass others. In other words, outstrip them, outdo them, exceed them. This is not about mediocrity. This is about somebody who puts their hand to their gift and they maximize their gift to its greatest capacity. This is somebody who, by using their gift and their talent, that God will use it to put you in the presence of great men, not, not mediocre men, not unknown men, that your exceptional uh, presentation of your gift would in fact inspire people to want to draw you into their presence and into their, into their company. Jim Collins, Jim Collins, the author of the book, Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make the Leap and Others Don't. It's a business book that will bless you. He remarks this, he says, few people attain great lives in large part because it's just so easy to settle for a good life. In other words, they settle for good when they could have been great. And I think that's true about people, that many people when it comes to their lives, they settle for having a good life, a mediocre life, when God has called you to have a great life. He says, I have come that you might have life and have that life more abundantly, that you would have a great life. Now, when I talk about having a great life, I'm not talking about being rich. I'm not talking about being famous. There's a lot of people who are rich, who are famous, who are not great people. So when I talk about pay, being, having a great life, I'm talking about being, becoming the best version of you that you possibly can. That you become the best version of what God has called you to do in this world as you possibly can. Now, now quite honestly, sadly, there are a lot of believers today who simply just exist, right? Some are even, uh, they're not growing. We're not conquering new territory. They're not winning victories. They're not sharing Christ with others. Uh, they're not becoming, and even with all the time that they've been saved, as the years go by, as the calendar years go by, they're not becoming deeper Christians or having a closer walk with God. In fact, some of them are actually withering. You do, not, do not make the mistake of assuming that just because somebody's been at church a long time that they are growing spiritually. That age calendar-wise does not equate to wisdom in all cases. 
that though you could brag, I've been in church or I've been in the way or I've been around the church for 10 years, for 20 years, or I've been in church since I've been knee high to a grasshopper. And you assume that because somebody's been at a church or a ministry for 15, 20 years, that that automatically equates to spiritual development and growth. But in fact, some people are not progressing, but they're actually regressing. You know why? Because they opt for mediocrity. Just enough to get by. I just want to I just want to be in the building. I just want to be around the church. I just want to have my name on the roll. I just, it's enough for me to say that I am connected to a church or associated with a pastor, but they don't challenge themselves to do anything greater than that. So they've made the connection with the church or put their name on a church roll or maybe they've joined an, a ministry an auxiliary and they stop there. Right. And so they settle for mediocrity. When God has called you to excel, yeah, to excel, to outstrip, to outdo, to exceed, to excel means I'm not doing just the bare minimum just to say I was in the number, but I'm going beyond. I'm digging deep. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing past mediocrity into something that God has called me to do. And what happens here is God, God has put exceptional gifts down in you and creativity down in you that pull you, that push you into being the greatest person that you could possibly be in the birth, in the earth. Well, let me take my time. I got a lot to say to you tonight and I don't want to rush past this moment. The first time we see creativity in the Bible is when God created the heavens and the earth. So let me back up here. Creativity is defined as the ability to bring something new into existence, to produce something through imaginative skill. One person said it like this, creativity is pushing open the heavy door of life, pushing open the heavy door of life and, and, and walking into a broader horizon of things that you may have experienced before. I'm, I'm pushing the envelope. I'm, I'm deciding by, by the act of my will to step out of the norm, to step out of what is expected, to step out of what is usual, and I'm pushing into something that is unusual. The first time we see this is in the book of Genesis where it talks about God and God created the heavens and the earth. That, that out of the vast, inexhaustible resources of God's imagination, he created everything. That, that he reached back within his own mind and stood on the sea of darkness that was before him. And he reached into the corners of his own mind and he gave, get this, creative expression to his own thoughts. Oh, I want you to hang on that for a minute. Meaning that everything that you see existed in God's mind and it did not show itself until God spoke. But when God spoke, he spoke out of his mind and what came out of his mouth through his creative expression. That it wasn't enough that things existed in God's mind and in God's head. It came into existence when he spoke and through his creative expression. Ah, uh, everything we see came into being, and the Bible says, and God said, and there was. And God has given us the same, consequently as human beings, uh, created in the image of God, he's given us the same creative ability, that we can literally speak things into existence, that it does no good for you to have great thoughts, great ideas, great talent, if you keep it to yourself and you keep it inside. But God has ordained it that the things of this world will be affected by the things that are within you. And that as you begin to draw out of those things, the, the, uh, draw out of your resources, draw out of the richness, the vastness that God has put down in you, that God has invested greatness down in you. He has ingressed, invested great potential. There it is down in you that you must now become like a miner and begin to mine those things out of you that God has already hidden down within you. What am I saying? I'm saying that greatness is already in you, that you ain't got to go find it. You don't have to go buy it. You don't have to purchase it. You ain't got to do nothing special to attain it. It's already there. And then God has given you the task and telling you to pull out of you the greatness that is within you. And there are a lot of mediums that we can use to pull out expression. For example, with all the latent potential that we all have, uh, God uses various mediums. For example, the arts, uh, literature, science, music, 
architecture, technology. These are all vehicles or mediums that God uses to pull out of us and give us that creative expression. Now, the problem most of us is uh, that we are born with this latent potential and we have this creative expression of power. It just often remains uh, untapped, untapped, unrealized, capped, and untouched that you are like a fancy car with hundreds of, 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 hundreds of, of engine horsepower that you never drive. That, that you have all this creative power in you. Many of the things that you complain about, the things that you fuss about, the things that you keep saying, I wish somebody would do something about that, that in reality, the answer to those issues and problems are within you. And you keep waiting for somebody to come, somebody on a white horse to come and rescue you. Is it possible that you are the answer that you've been looking for? Is it possible that, 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 that you are the, the answer to that question, but you don't have the confidence to rise to the call that God has put on your life? Oh, I want to get into this. Dr. Miles Monroe, the late Dr. Miles Monroe said this, and I, I, I admired him so much when he was alive. He said, what can you do that you haven't yet done? And where can you go that you haven't yet gone? Who can you be that you haven't yet been? What can you imagine that you haven't yet imagined? How far can you reach that you haven't yet reached what can you see that you haven't yet seen? And what can you accomplish that you haven't yet accomplished? That is the great question before each of us today. Because put in simple terms, what can you do that is beyond what you've already done? Are you under the assumption that whatever you've accomplished is all that there is? That whatever you've tapped into is all that God has for you? Is it possible that there's more in you than you realize? Is it possible that there's more in you than you have possibly tapped into? See, the problem with many people is we think that as far as we've gone is, is as far as we can go. That I've reached this certain level of life, of success, of love, and that there's nothing else beyond that. And the truth of the matter is, there is more. There is more in you. Most people don't make the leap from being good to being great because they accept good as good enough, not realizing that there's even more to you than you've even touched into. And that's the great question that many of us have to answer. Is there more? Is, is there more to see than what I've seen? Is there more in me than I've even put? Is it possible that I have untapped resources? That the real issue is not that I'm not enough. Maybe the real issue is that I'm more than enough and I just don't realize it. That maybe I, don't, I haven't surrounded myself with people who saw more in me than I could do and I've accepted their limiting attitude and decided that what they see is all I can be rather than looking up to my creator and looking up to my God and saying, God, as creative as you are, as vast as you are, as, as, as awe-inspiring as you are, is it possible that you've got something licked, locked down in me that I haven't even touched into? I hope I'm inspiring somebody now. I'm going to question you. I hope the questions I'm asking you are making you uncomfortable because many people are sitting on the road of mediocrity and they don't push the envelope. They don't challenge themselves to be better than they are now. And so they could have been great, but they settle for good. I believe that one of the greatest dangers to creativity is complacency. Complacency, where you simply just lose the desire or resist the call to be progressive in your thinking. Yeah, you resist the call. You, you feel the call, you sense the call, you know there's something greater in the horizon, but you, by an act of your will, you resist it. Uh, you resist the, the, the call to be progressive. And pro being progressive is a calling. It is something, if, if, if everybody could do it, everybody would do it. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many people sense the desire to do something greater, 
But everybody doesn't take that next step and say, I'm going to step into the abyss and see what lies beyond what we are. So if we're going to walk with God, please understand that your God is progressive. This is why you should be concerned about being mediocre and sitting on the sidelines of life, because the God you serve is progressive. And if you're going to walk with God, you got to be somebody that the Bible says goes from faith to faith and from glory to glory. From the book of generate, from the book of Genesis, all the way from the book of Genesis, where God is called is seen, is seen moving on the face of the water, all the way to the book of Revelations. Our God is progressive. He is steadily moving forward. He is steady, and if we're going to walk with Him, He's steady saying, "I want you to move." forward. God, I've done this, but yeah, there's more. There's more I want out of you. It's more I, there's more I put in you. Always seeking to go to the next stage of growth. Never accepting this level of where I am and not accepting the fact that God may be caught. Is it possible? Is it possible that God has called you to do more? That as you rush quickly to the ends of our life and all of us are born to die, that there is something more that God has put in you that he wants out of you. You should be uncomfortable. You should be uncomfortable with the, with the, with, without answering the question of, am I doing all that God has called me to do? Am I pulling on all of my gifts and all of my talents? Am I really tapping into God has made this great body, this great human being with this great intellect and this great mind? Am I exercising it to the greatest of my God-given ability? Now, if you're going to be a kind of person to ask those questions, that means you have to be constantly monitoring your efforts to bring that about. Everywhere that you're seeing real change and real growth, there is a conscious deliberate changing of the guards. You hear what I say? That greatness doesn't happen by accident. That things don't change all by themselves. That, but that everywhere you see real change, real change and real growth, there is a conscious, deliberate changing of the guards. People, somebody sitting around right now and making an intentional decision, I want more. If you don't get anything out of this class tonight, I hope to put a hunger down in you that says, I want more. See, when we talk about having more, we talk about having more houses, more cars, more money, more influence. But I'm talking about having more of you, having more freedom, having more flow, having more of an ability to flow in what God has called you to do. In fact, if you're watching me right now, I want you to type it in that post, in that page right there and say, I want more. I hope that tonight God has put a hunger down in you that stands before a full fountain like an empty, an empty pitcher and says, God, I want more. I know that you are an awesome God. I know that you can do anything but fail. I know, God, that you invested so much in this body and in this life. And I want more. I want more out of me. I want more commitment out of me. I want more tenacity out of me. I want more uh, ability out of me. I want more. I want to uh, sharpen my skills. I want to sharpen my ability. Whatever your ability is, whether you sing or whether you preach or whether you teach or whether you dance, I want to challenge you not to accept mediocrity. I want to challenge you not to rest on yesterday and to push yourself and say, I wonder what's beyond this door. I wonder what's beyond this stage. I've already seen that level. I've already seen that stage. Been there, done that, got a t-shirt. Some people are stuck on their laurels and not realizing that God has called you to do more. I want more. More faithfulness, more revelation, more insight, more wisdom. Oh, but I, I'm not, I, I want more things that don't cost money. The ability to love without abandon, to forgive often, to, oh my God. I, I, I want to have more of a generous spirit. Hallelujah. A generous spirit? Yeah, because I realize that if I give it away, God will give me more. Oh God, Lord, give me more. I, I'm a, so I'm going to talk to you today. I'm going to talk to you about, I, 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 I want to talk to you about three little letters. K-I-M. Keep it moving. K-I-M. Keep it moving. Not settling for where you are. 
Not settling for what you've done. Do you know that God is not doing an encore? That everything that God has for you is in your future, not in your past. That everything that God wants to do, your latter days shall be greater than your former days. That everything that God has for you is waiting on you in your future. And if you take a seat in Zion, take a seat in mediocrity, you're bragging about the eight, nine things you did last year or the year before that. And God is calling you to do 20, 30, 40 things. God is, oh my God, I feel an anointing in here. That God is trying to pull you off your couch and pull you away from your excuses and pull you away from this walking away. No wonder you don't have a sense of fulfillment because you can't be fulfilled with yesterday's bread oh my god i said something right there you cannot be fulfilled with yesterday's bread god gives you fresh bread for today he gives you fresh challenges for today he gives you fresh mercy for today no wonder you're not feeling fulfilled because you've used up the mercy from yesterday that was yesterday's mercy that was yesterday's bread you trying to live off a of molded bread and old accomplishments and outdated information and god wants to give you fresh revelation oh my god fresh bread from heaven fresh anointing you're trying to operate off of last year's anointing last month's anointing you got videos and pictures of things you did five years ago but God said I want to do something in your latter days that's going to outshine that's going to outdo that's going to outlast what I've already done God is always trying to find a way to one up himself yeah, that's what it is. God is always trying to find a way to outshine himself. Uh, the Bible says that the path of the righteous grow, grows brighter and brighter until the perfect day. That the closer I get to the goal of being in his presence, that I'm outshining everything I did yesterday. God has anointing that's waiting on you that far exceeds the anointing that you've already experienced. Woo! I feel something in this house right now. I, I, feel, something, I feel something happening through this message. I feel... I feel God challenging somebody to get up, get out, and push yourself. If you're sitting near somebody, sitting close to somebody, watching this either live or watching this later on, find somebody and push on them. In fact, send them an email, send them a text, and just say push. If they ask you what you're talking about, then you can preach this message to them. God said push. Going to be a push. So, so I want to share with you three things, three things, three things. Three things. I want to talk to you about renewing your mind. I want to talk about retooling your life. And then finally, I want to talk about redirecting your energy. All right? Renewing your mind, number one. Retooling your life. And then I want to talk about redirecting your energy. Look at somebody and say, keep it moving. Don't get stuck. Don't allow yourself to get stuck in whatever place that you're in. Financially, emotionally, physically. For God's sake, don't get stuck. God said, keep it moving. Number one, renew your mind. Romans 12 and 2, you know this. The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Two words I want you to catch out of that verse, transformation and renewal. Transformation is derived from the word metamorpho, where we get the word metamorphosis. And a metamorphosis is a complete change. And get this, structure and or substance, form, structure, or substance. That's a metamorphosis. And what it conjures up is the image of the caterpillar who goes through a transformation, who goes into a cocoon. And within that cocoon, he goes through a transformation so that what emerges from that cocoon looks totally and completely different than what went into the cocoon. And God is trying to tell somebody right now that for what I want to do in your life, I'm going to change you so much that people who thought they knew you won't even recognize you. See, some of you, you're going to have to testify. You're going, we don't have testimony services anymore, you know, like we did in the old church. But you're going to have to find somebody and testify because you're not going to look like what you went through. And God is going to bless your life so much that, that people are going to look at you and won't even believe that's where you started. He's going to bless you to have so much success that people won't believe that's where you used to live, that that's the people you used to run with, that those are the people that you used to be attracted to. Oh, see, y'all don't believe that. Y'all don't believe it. There are some, there, God can change you so drastically that you have to open your mouth and testify because people wouldn't believe it by looking at you. See, that's the problem with a lot of people right now. Your real power is in your testimony. 
You try to preach messages and try to find profound revelations out of the word of God. Your life should be the greatest message that anybody sees. Because as you look at my life now, you praising God for where I am. No, and by no means am I where I should be. But, but don't look at where I should be. You should look at the hole I crawled out of. Oh, my God. I may not be as great as you think I should be or as smart as you think I should be, but you should measure me by the hole that I crawled out of. You should have saw the things that had me snared and tied up and hung up. You should have saw the things that threatened my future. You should have saw the things that should have took me out. You should have saw the drugs that didn't kill me or the alcohol that didn't catch me or the situation that didn't bind me or the things that didn't happen that should have got me shot or killed. The very fact that I'm here is a testimony to the power of God because if if the devil had his way oh my lord I don't feel like getting preachy in here but anytime you talk talking about destiny and testifying about where God brought me from I get happy all by myself and some of you right there out there right now can testify the same way if God if if people were to see the hole you came out of they would see how great your God is that God will transform your life and change you so much that people won't even recognize you. <laughs> I'm being transformed as you speak. If you knew me a year ago, I'm not the same person I was a year ago. I don't think the same way. I don't see it the same way. If you're still looking at the same thing the same way, I challenge you to think differently. Because every year that you learn, every year that you live, you should be learning something new. You should be learning something different. You should be going into higher heights and to deeper depths into God's word, into revelation. And it's not about comparing yourself to other people. I mean comparing yourself to where you were five years ago, ten years ago. If you're still looking at it the same way, I'm telling you that there's something wrong because there's something in you that God should be giving you greater revelation deeper wisdom oh my god transformation renewal the word renewal means to make fresh to make vibrant to make new again it's the restoration of what has become faded or disintegrated and so that it feels like new i'm gonna say something i'm gonna get into some deep water here some high grass some people get into nonsense because they're just bored it's a gift to bear to find something new in an old thing. I, I was reading uh, the words of Doc, uh, Mr. Donald Crum. He's a Nobel Prize winning chemist, has been made many, many contributions to the world of chemistry and science. And he said this, he said, in order for me to retain my fascination with chemistry, I had to change my research field about every 10 years. He spent his whole life studying medicine, spent his whole life doing all kinds of research. And the reason why he was able to stay in that field and to make all the contributions that he made in something that he did for over 50, 60 years is because every 10 years he said he would change and do research in another area. Keep it fresh, keep it new. See, that, that's, the, that's the challenge with marriage. The challenge with marriage is to keep it fresh, to keep it new. Many people, many people can't get beyond the, 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 the excitement of a new relationship because they haven't figured out the secret to how, how do you keep on loving the same person for 30 years? How do you, how do you keep the music playing? How, how do you get excited about the same church and the same people in the same city for years and years and years? How, how do you keep a level of intensity about something that you've gotten used to? See, the danger of anything is no matter what it is, no matter how good it is, you get used to it. Trust me. You remember you got that new car, had the new car smell. You got the new car. You, you, I mean, you, you, you didn't want nobody eating anything in it. You didn't want nobody drinking anything in it. You, you babied it. You washed it. You vacuumed it all the time. Now you've had it about three or four years. You just throw McDonald's bags in the back of the car and... You know, you don't wash it like you used to. You barely get into the oil chain, stuff like that, because I don't care what you have. You get a new house, oh my God, you're fascinated with the house. And oh my God, everything has to be just so, but then you get used to it. You get into a new church. You know, you're meeting new people and new pastor and new ministries and all this kind of thing. You get excited, oh my God. But then no matter what it is, you get used to it. 
And so even as we go forward in our ministries and in our lives, we have to constantly be reinventing ourselves and, 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 and having the gift to see the new thing in an old thing. Oh, I'm talking tonight. I, I, I'm talking better than y'all responding right now. Uh, the ability to see a new thing in an old thing is a gift. And our inability to see fresh things out of old situations leaves us open to mediocrity, and mediocrity leads to trouble. Anybody remember, I, I'm probably telling my age here now, but when I was a kid, there used to be uh, a, a, a character called Dennis the Menace. Right? He was in comic books, but he was also on television for a while, Dennis the Menace. And, and, and his little boy, uh, they lived in this neighborhood, and they called him the Menace because David was, Dennis wasn't a bad boy. He wasn't a wicked boy. He was bored. And so he was always into something. He was always getting involved in some nonsense, some foolishness. He was always having the neighbors yell at him and his parents yell at him. And people say, oh, my God, it's Dennis the Menace. He just drove people crazy. But you know what was wrong with Dennis? He was bored. He needed something to do. He needed something to give his attention to. And some of you, some of you are like Dennis the Menace. In the absence of going after your real purpose, you get into nonsense. You get into foolishness. You get into gossip. That's why you spend so much time chasing down rumors and talking about people, because you need to get you some business. Yeah, I'm gonna tell it to you, I'm tell it to you straight. You're all in my business because you need to get you some business. Get you something to go after. People who are really going after their goals, if you notice, they don't have time to sit around and gossip. I'm too busy working on my dream. I ain't got time to criticize you. I ain't got time to figure out what you're doing with your life and what you're not doing and who you with and who you talk. I ain't got time for that because I'm too busy going after my dream. Some of you are allowing rumors and foolishness and nonsense to derail your goals and derail your vision because you can't stay out of nonsense. I'm trying to tell somebody the secret to making it to be successful is to run after your destiny. If you focus on and run after your destiny, then your history won't be able to hold on to you. Don't let nobody hold you back in who you used to be and what you used to do. Listen, if you're gonna talk about me, you're gonna, talk, you're gonna be talking to my back. I promise you, because I'm not even gonna spend time standing there talking to you about it. You're gonna be talking to my back because I'm moving. You might talk about me, but you'll be talking about me behind me because everything that God has for me is in front of me. Get out of that nonsense. Get away from the gossip. Hang up the phone on some of these people. Unfriend a few of them. Block some of these people because these people want to keep you stuck with them because misery loves company. I, I have to hang out with people who are just as mediocre as I am to be comfortable. Have you ever noticed that as long as you are hanging out in mediocrity and hanging out with people who are low thinking and low living and not going anywhere, that we're all cool because we're in the same boat. But the moment you get in your mind that I want to be something more, I want to have something greater, then they start treating you like, oh, you so such a much, you just acting like you all that. No, I'm not acting like I'm all that. I'm saying that I want more out of my life and I can't have more out of my life if I'm hanging around. I can't fly with eagles if I'm hanging around with chickens. No wonder you can't get up there and do the things that God's called you to do. You got too many chickens in your life. You got to get rid of some of these chickens. You were created for more than that. You were created for more. God did not give you that mind, that bright, intelligent mind, so you can chase down the, 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 the newest rumors. What an insult to the life that God has given you. If all you did all your life was chase down rumors and foolishness and gossip and nonsense and, ooh, did you hear the latest? I don't care about the latest. If it's not pushing me toward my destiny or pushing me toward my goal or helping me be a better person or challenging me to do what I need to do, I don't want to hear it. You got to stop letting people use your life like a trash can. Clean that junk out and run after your destiny. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You're spinning your wheels. You're wasting your time and you're putting your energy into unproductive activity. And self-destructive behavior. That's the challenge I want to give you. See, see, somebody said this, and I think it's very true. I can relate to it being a middle aged man. They said middle aged disease is this is when your broad mind and your narrow waist 
switch places. <laughs> that sounds funny, but I can really relate to it. As a young person, as a young mind, we come into the world with such broad minds. Anything is possible. Anything is, is I mean, you, you can dream great dreams and have great plans. And you, your mind is just so open and vast and anything is possible. But you got a little small waist, right? You got that youthful looking body. But as you get older, you get more settled. You get more, uh, you settle more into mediocrity. You start accepting things. And so what happens is your body gets broader, but your mind gets more narrow. You would think that the older you get, the more optimistic you become. But for many people, the older they get, the more cynical you become. Then you find yourself saying things like, well, we did that before. I've seen that before. I've seen that movie. I already had that done before. I already tried that before. I've already been down that street. And so your cynicism is what's keeping you captive. Your cynicism. Imagine God, God, as vast as he is, sitting back looking at us saying, you haven't even touched the surface of what I could do. You, you, you haven't even scratched the surface of the things that I could do. Eye has, not, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. You ain't touched the surface yet. How dare you? You've been here 20, 30, 40, 50 years. God is from eternity past into eternity future. And you think that because you've been in church for 40 years that you've seen everything that God is going to do? Oh, my God. That you see in 40 years, God is from eternity to eternity. And you think in 40 years, you got it all summed up. You got it all figured out. God said, you ain't seen nothing yet. You don't know nothing. Be quiet. Be quiet. I want you to come to me like somebody, like a child, like somebody who's still curious. You know why people are progressive and they move forward and they do great things? Because they're still curious. I wonder what else is in here. I wonder what else God can do. I wonder what else I can do with this. I wonder what else there's in there. Because, but when you close the book and decide, okay, I passed the class. I know everything. I'm ready to be the teacher. God says, sit down. Sit down. You ain't ready to be no teacher. You ain't heard nothing yet. But if you get in the spirit, God said, I'm going to reveal this to you through the spirit. Woo. You ought not be satisfied with your prayer life. You ought not be satisfied with what you know about the word of God. You ought not be satisfied with your, with your praise and your worship. There is higher heights, there's deeper depths. And the moment you become satisfied and decide that the student wants to become the teacher, God says, sit down. You don't know nothing yet. Be quiet. I got stuff to show you ain't even seen yet. Woo. Oh, my God. If I had a room full of people, I tell you, lift your hands right now and say, God, give me more. Give me more revelation. I'm a fool. I don't know nothing. I'm like Paul. I count everything I've done and everything I've accomplished and everything I've achieved like dung, like trash for the excellency of Jesus Christ. You can't be excellent in Christ while you're still bragging on yesterday. God, help me go further. Woo. Oh, my God. Nick, number two. Number two. If you're going to go into a level of excellence, you're going to have to retool your life. Right? You have to retool your life. Uh, this idea is particularly interesting in the automobile industry, right? Because every so often what they may do is they'll shut down certain parts of the plant, right? So they can bring in new equipment. And this new equipment is designed to uh, manufacture the new product, right? So, so if they have a certain model of car or a certain kind of car that they've had for years and years, and they want to introduce a new model or a new type of car that may have the greatest technology or the latest technology, they'll shut down part of the plant and they'll take out those old equipment and then they'll put in new equipment that is designed to accommodate the new product that they're creating and they call it retooling. Meaning that the tools I had are obsolete they are no longer compatible. They were good for that time. They were good for that era, but they don't work for what we're doing now. I come to tell somebody that God is trying to help you to retool, that the tools you use then are not going to be effective for right now. Now, the tools that you had then would work if you had an old model car, if you had something that was obsolete, if you had something that was made 10, 15 years ago, but for this new kind of car with the new technology, 
technology, with the upgrades, with the advancements that are happening, you're going to need to have new tools to fit the new technology to take the new journey. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, oh, I feel like preaching up in here. For somebody here, God is saying it's not that your tool that you had is bad. It's just obsolete. It's not compatible. It doesn't work. Woo. It was great for then. It's not good for now. It got you here, but it won't get you there. And God is saying, I'm pulling you aside. In fact, I believe that what God is doing through this whole coronavirus is pulling some of us, churches, ministers, pastors, business people, husbands, wives, friends. He's pulling us all together, sitting us down for a minute and say, I got to give you some new tools. I got to give you some new tools. The stuff you did then was great if you were trying to go backwards. But if you're trying to go forward, what I'm giving you now will not be compatible with what you had then. Jesus of Nazareth. I wish somebody heard me up in here today. God said, I want to give you some new tools. I want to give you some new tools because you can't produce a new thing with old ideas. Oh, you can turn me off now. I know you're mad at me by now. I done got on your nerves. You, you can't produce a new thing with old ideas. So what do you got to do? You may have to re-educate yourself, reacquaint yourself, reinvent yourself. Oh, oh my God. See, we don't want to talk about re-educating ourselves because that's going to take more time. We don't want to talk about reacquainting ourselves because that's going to take more study. That's going to take more growth. That's going to take more energy. But that's what God wants you to do, to put more energy into being the best version of you if possible. Oh, my God. See, the reason the reason why the stuff you did yesterday don't work today is because it's not compatible. This ain't your grandmother's church. I'm sorry. This ain't your granddaddy's church. The whole world has changed. The way we do business has changed. If you're still doing things the way we did even a year ago, you are a dinosaur. The, the, the business models that we had five, ten years ago don't fit for the technology that we have today. And people who insist on making things the way they were are going to find themselves left behind. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm in our church and I'm teaching Bible class and I'm, I'm, I'm really anticipating the day that we are able to have our worship services and everybody's in here worshiping God. But in the back of my mind, I realize that church can't be the same as it was. And everybody's anxious to get back to work and back to our economy and back to church like we used to, not realizing that the church, the business, the country that we knew has changed. It's never going back to the way it was. It's not going back. We can be in the same building, but it's not going back to the way it was. It can't. It can't because that was something that God breathed for that time. But now God is helping us retool, re reinvent ourselves. And it's hard. And it's hard because what we're used to, what we're familiar with, I know what that is. Yeah, I know what that is. I understand that. I've been steeped in that for a long time. I can do that in my sleep. I ain't even got to think about it. I know how that works. I know the jargon. The, I know what, what should be said, what should be sung, what should be go here, what should go there. And so I'm comfortable in that world. But, but the problem is my discomfort with my future is messing up where I am right now. Oh, my Lord. My, my ability to be comfortable where I am like a baby stuck in a mother's womb. I'm comfortable here. But if I'm going to have the next level of life and the next level of ministry and the next level of business and the next level of relationship. I'm going to have to step out of the familiar and step into the unfamiliar and I got to give up my obsolete tools and my obsolete weapons so that I can grab hold of the weapons that God has given me for these new giants. There, there, there's fresh levels. There's fresh devils for these levels. You can't fight the giants of your tomorrow with the tools you had from yesterday. I'm trying to tell somebody something here. You got giants waiting on you. You got challenges waiting on you. You got things ahead of you. You got victories waiting on you, but you can't get there using the tools you had yesterday. Woo! Oh my God. Oh my God. And I'm not talking about being 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old. I'm not talking about your age on a calendar. I'm talking about your mentality that says to me, I got to get some new tools for this new level. Woo! 
Oh, my God. Oh, oh, my God. That's why you got to introduce some younger people into the conversation. You got to introduce some new ideas, some creative ideas. Let your, I, you know, I don't want to be surrounded by a bunch of old people. I, I love them. I respect them. I love all old people. And I think that they have something to offer. The Bible says he called the young because they're strong. And he called the old because they know the way. There is wisdom. There is wisdom in getting old. It takes courage. Let me stop right here. It takes courage to get old. It takes courage. It takes courage to get old. To get old enough that you're still here and you're still around and you may not walk as fast as you used to, but your mind is just as bright and just as sharp and just as open. It takes courage to get older. It takes courage to get older, to get old enough to take care of kids and grandkids and drop wisdom and still be relevant. It takes courage to do that. How dare us throw aside our older people as if they have nothing else to offer. They should be respected. They should be honored because it takes courage to get my age. Uh, you come out here, you just got here, 9, 10, 15 years old. You think you know everything. You haven't lived life yet. You haven't been through nothing yet. You haven't buried anybody yet. You haven't gone through the challenges that these older people have gone through. They've stood the test of time, and they're still here, and they should be respected. They should be honored. They should be put in a place of esteem because it takes raw courage to get our age and still be here with a smile on your face. <laughs> uh, but we have to invite younger ideas into the conversation because they are gonna help us understand the challenges that we're dealing with today. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, oh my Lord. God, God in his wisdom has designed it that way that as we hand off, see, how are we gonna hand off the baton to the next generation if we refuse to even let the baton go? You ever seen a relay race? In a relay race, the person who's running is running, he's running, he's running, and the person that is about to take the, the, the running opportunity has to at first catch up to his same rhythm and catch his speed. So when you watch him exchange the baton, for a while, the person who's getting ready to run is running to catch up to the same speed of the person who's already running. So there's a successful handoff. I'm afraid in this generation that we're not successfully handing off. We're making our younger people start all over from square one. We're doing with the church what we've done with our natural families. We die without leaving them a map, a road map. We die without preparing them for the future. We die without teaching them what it's gonna take to run things. We die without showing them the business. We die without sharing with them the wisdom. We die without giving them the tools. And so they, we go to the grave with the tools. So they got to start all over from square one and work their way up. But I believe that God is causing his body to work together so that what you know begins to catch with what I know for the leg that I have to run. And that you're not intimidated and that you're not being fake and that you're not trying to be phony and that you're not quietly, secretly hoping that I fail. Oh, my God. If you can let go of what is was done for you, God will take you into something else. Ah, oh my God. You don't want to let go of the baton because you think there's nothing else after this. And God said, I got something else for you. I got something else for you to do. I ain't done with you, Joshua. <laughs> you 85 years old, still killing giants, a giant killer in your old age, and you're still taking mountains, and you're still taking territory, but you got to let go of what was so that you can have what will be. Oh, Lord Jesus. I feel like having church all by myself. I feel God stirring something on the inside. Number three, number three. You're going to have to redirect your energy. Redirect your energy. The energy, the passion that you once put into one thing, God said is for this new level, I want you to put that same energy into this. I admire the fact that you put in work 15 years ago and you put energy into what you did five years ago and you put effort into something you did a year ago. But God said, I don't want you to cut off your energy. I don't want your energy to diminish. I just want you to redirect your energy. I, I've moved the target so that instead of you t running after that, you can hand that off to somebody else now. I give you something that I need to redirect, uh, redirect your energy. Redirecting your energy means you have the courage to, here it is, consciously, deliberately change the direction that you're headed in in order to see results. Yeah. It, I, I'm a person who goes up and down in my way. 
And I don't mind saying that because some of y'all do too. Pray for me. But, but one of the things that, that, that I run into when I really get conscious about my weight and getting it down and getting where it needs to be is I tend to plateau, right? So when I first get on a weight loss program, I lose weight quickly. Change my diet, working out, getting my cardio up, doing weights, all that kind of stuff, and the weight will just fall off. And I'll see results in maybe a, a week or two. But then, but then people, and people who lose weight can relate to this, you hit what they call a plateau. When you hit a plateau, you're doing the same amount of work, but you're getting less effort. You're getting less results. Hear what I say? So, so if you're somebody who is, uh, for example, running five miles a day, and you're seeing great results, woo, five miles a day. But then after a while, you're still doing the five miles a day, but you're not losing the weight as fast. And you're not seeing the change in your body as quickly. And you scratch your head and say, well, I'm doing the same amount of work, but I'm getting less results. And so what happens is, what happens is you got to trick your body into action by changing up your routine. And it, <laughs> you, you got to trick your body by doing something different. So if you're used to doing five miles, you might do five miles and then do some weights. Or you might do weights first and do five miles. Or you may just trick yourself and do it in the evening or do it at night. But what happens is you have to trick your body into doing it differently and exercise muscles that you didn't have. And this is what I found out. This is what I found out. It doesn't have to be drastic changes. That, that small changes can yield big results. See, some people are intimidated about going forward because you're thinking about all the things I got to change. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I was, I was going 90 miles an hour in this direction. I got to spin around and go 90 miles in another direction. And so the, the, the magnitude of the, 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 uh, the magnitude, the magnitude of just changing that is intimidating. And you'd rather keep going in the wrong direction than to spin around and go back in the right direction. It's too much work. But sometimes it's just little small changes, subtle changes. Little, little small changes can change your whole relationship. I'm telling you what I know, little small changes. You ain't got to go and do nothing great, big, grand, and bombastic. Just, just small changes. Small changes in your diet can yield great results in your body. Small changes, reading a book a day or a book a week, a different kind of book. Right? Some of us need to, need, need to learn how to read something more than the Bible. Oh, okay. Uh, Y'all done shut me down now. Right? You got to read some other material, some other literature, so that you can have an intelligent conversation about something other than Peter, James, and John. And I'm not saying get rid of Peter, James, and John. But if we're going to be relevant, we're going to be real and make a difference, we got to be able to translate Peter, James, and John into a contemporary society, or we're not in the conversation. We're not in the conversation. What, what are you learning about money? What are you learning about relationships? What are you learning about the economy? What are you learning about health? What are you learning? Those sort of things that you can now redirect your energy into. Take your energy. Now, when I say redirect your energy, let me be specific. Take your energies out of things and people and mentalities that are not working and put them into something that will. Some of you have great energy, but you're going after the wrong thing. It's like somebody going 90 miles an hour in the wrong direction. You have great passion about stuff that yields no return. You have great passion about things that have no relevance, no importance. You, I mean, you, you're all up in arms. You're, you'll be up all night long putting energy into stuff that yields no return. So you got to pull that energy out of stuff. We do it with people all the time. We put great energy into relationships that yield us nothing. Do you hear me? You're putting great energy into relationships that have no return. Great love, great loyalty, great respect in the relationships that will give you nothing back. You got to disconnect, you got to unplug, you got to pull it out of that and put it into something that's going to give you a return. Oh, I'm messing up somebody's relationships right now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But no matter how much you put into that, it's not going to change it. It's not going to change it. It is what it is. 
And you have to be smart enough to understand that if love is not being served there no more, you got to get up from the table because while you're sitting at that table with somebody that you're not going to get anything out of, there's somebody waiting on you to take you into your destiny. Jesus of Nazareth. I, oh, my Lord. I don't know why I keep saying this kind of stuff to you. You might have to email me, text me, say something. To, I don't know. But, but, but listen, listen, listen. God is saying, pull your energy out of that. Pull your energy out of that. Pull it. Nobody's going to do that for you. You wonder why you feel drained. You're putting out more energy and getting less done because you're putting your energies into the wrong things. They're not consistent with your future. They're not consistent with, your, with, your, with, your, with, with God's plans for you. They're not consistent with what God has showed you. And why are you putting so much energy into something that you get so little out of? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Jesus, Jesus is walking uh, around... Uh, in Luke chapter 5, he was walking on the shores of Nazareth and he encountered some men who were experienced, accomplished men in their field. See, this is where some of us have to be humble. See, Jesus wasn't no fisherman. But when he ran up on some men that this is what they do for a living, <laughs> they would, they, this, is what they, this is what they did all their life. They knew the fishing business. They knew it in and out. But on this particular day, they were doing everything they could and were getting no results. Here is pride to continue to do something when you know it's not working. And Jesus comes along who had no experience in fishing. It was not his background and tries to give them advice as to what to do. And I can imagine human nature probably thought, man, you don't know what you're talking about. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been in this neighborhood all this time. I've been around. I was around. See, and the pride, the pride of not being able to say, you know what? I know I've been doing this a long time. I got a degree in this. I got a background in this. My daddy did this. My granddaddy did this. Is it possible that I may not be, that I may not know something that I need for the next thing? Is it possible? I'm not saying it is, but is it possible that your limited growth is because you refuse to get new information. Oh, oh, my Lord. And here was Jesus with a simple word. He challenged them to do something different. Throw your net on the other side. What? On the other side? What do you, first of all, Jesus, the wrong time of day to be trying to fish like this is late. Secondly, this is not what you do. I can imagine somebody ready to say, Jesus, Jesus, stay in your lane. Okay? I got this. I've been doing this for 30, 40 years. I know what I'm doing. And so I, I can imagine somebody was willing to shut him down. But humility stepped in and caused them to listen to this little preacher from a little town called Nazareth who didn't know anything about the fishing business. Who said, throw your net on the other side. Now, if he had told him to throw your net on the same side, I'm down with that. I will throw my energy right back into the same things I'm getting no results out of because I know the business. But he said, I want you to trust me and do something different. And I hear somebody right now saying, well, pastor, I've done that before. I I I've tried that before. I, I, I tried to work with this marriage before. It didn't work. I tried to start this business before, it didn't work. I, I tried to offer my gifts to my church, to my pastor. It didn't work, it, it burned, it crashed and burned in a miserable failure. I, I tried offering my gifts to the church just because I love the Lord. Now, now, now I don't wanna do it out of my love, I wanna do it if I get paid. I'm tired of doing it because it's right. I wanna be compensated for it. I'm tired of doing it because I love the Lord. I'm tired of doing it because I want to be connected with the church or the pastor or the ministry. I got to do it now because this is a business transaction. And, and you wonder why you've reached a plateau in your life. Because you don't want to do something different. This is the time for us to all consider doing something different. You're so in love with things being back the way they were. That you haven't considered that maybe God wants to do something different different. And what is that? Have you taken the time to 
Go around in your life and dig into the, the pots and the pans and the drawers of your life to say, Lord, maybe there's something different. Maybe there's something I'm not seeing. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's something I haven't considered or something that I haven't tried. Maybe, just maybe, though you've been feeding me through this source, maybe there's another source that you want me to be open to. I've been shut down. I, 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 I shut out all these other opportunities for you to, to feed me or to bless me because I wanted to come a certain way. And some people will never be blessed because you've decided if it doesn't come a certain way, if it doesn't come through a certain person, if it doesn't come through a certain avenue, that I don't want it, that I reject it. But these men followed the word of the Lord and said, cast your net on the other side. Take all your energy that you were putting into stuff that wasn't working, and I want you to put that same energy, that same intensity, and throw it in another direction. Oh, God, throw it in another direction. I feel somebody's faith being challenged right now because you, you've gotten into this little rut. You've gotten into this routine. This is the way I do it. It's almost automatic. You don't even put no thought into it. You just push the buttons and walk away. You don't even go back to see. You, you don't critique your own stuff. How do you expect to get better if you don't even critique your own work? Because you're satisfied. But I want to challenge somebody today in your faith to, 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 to throw your net. You know, the nets is what they use to draw in their fish. It was the thing that they used to draw in. God didn't say throw in your fishing pole. Some of you want to just do a little bit, just be safe. God said throw the whole net out there. Throw it. Don't, don't let it down. Cast it. Cast it wide. Cast it far. Because what you're about to take in is going to blow your mind. They drew in so much fish, they had to get partners. One day I'm going to start talking to you about the power of partnership. For what God had for them, they needed partners. They needed partners to help them carry what God had released in them. Is it possible that God's about to release so much into your hands, you're going to have to set up partnerships away with you trying to be a one-man band and trying to do everything by yourself. God wants you to establish partnerships. I put my gifts with your gifts, and we're able to secure the blessing that God has for us. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I hear somebody say, I did that before, but God said, if you go back and do it now, it will work. This time, it will work. I had to get your mind straight. straight. I had to get your head right. But this time, it will work. Somebody type that in big, bold caps. This time, it will work. Yeah, make that a declaration to every devil, to every demon, to every critic, to every person that said you're not going to make it this time. I know I've tried before and I failed miserably. I know I've run before and fell flat on my face, but this time it will work. Last thing, I'm out. I'm done. I'm off my time. I just want to say you, your future is waiting on you. That's all I want to say to you. Your future is waiting on you. You're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you. Isaiah 66 and 9 says this, and I love the scripture. It says, shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith my God? God said, I've gotten you pregnant with possibilities. And I brought you all the way to the place of delivering. And you're feeling the, 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 the birth pangs of a, of, a, of a baby that's about to come out. And God said, I'm not going to let you go through nine months of being pregnant and watching your baby develop and get you right to the place we're about to deliver and not cause you to bring forth a child. Everything you've been going through are nothing but birth pains that are pushing you to push out your destiny, to push out your purpose, to push out what God has for you. And the enemy saying it's not going to come. But I'm telling you, God said, I'm not going to let you get this far in the process and not birth this baby. You are going to birth this one. That business that ministry, that church, you will birth it. You will bring forth that marriage. You will bring forth those kids. You will be healthy. You will be prosperous. You will. You're going to bring this baby. People are not going to believe that you're going to be like Sarah and have a baby in your old age. Oh, my God. They're going to look at you like it's too late. It's too far. You can't make it. But God said, I'm not going to let you go through. Listen, he's not going to let you go through everything you went through and not get nothing out of it. 
That's all I'm trying to tell you. All the things you owe it to yourself to survive because all the things you went through, all the hell you endured, all the things you had to put up with, all the times you stood by yourself, all the times you held your head up when you felt like dying, all the times you resisted the idea of suicide. God said, I'm not going to let you go through all of that and not get something out of it. God said, I'm going to have something come out of this. Something good is going to come out of this. Something great is going to come out of this. You're in pain now. You look bad now. Your feet are swelling and your ankles are swollen up and your head feels like it's about to pop up. But God said you're going to get something out of this. My back is hurting and these pains are coming every few minutes. But God said you're about to birth a dream. A dream you had in a long time. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to shut up. It's going to be bigger. Oh, I'm going. I'm out of here. It's going to be bigger than you thought. It's going to be bigger than you imagined. It's going to blow your mind because God is trying to get you to connect with your gift. And he's calling it to come forth now. Father, I pray for every person whose gift is stirred, who's wondering where I am in this time of my life, who feels pulled back, held back, having to retool, restructure, rename, rearrange your life. I'm praying, God, that everything that they're sacrificing to put themselves in position, that you, God, would cause that child to come forth. I decree, I decree and I declare right now by the power of the Holy Ghost that everything that God promised to you, it shall come to pass. Corona's not big enough to stop it. The economy's not big enough to stop it. The president's not big enough to stop it. Oh, my God. Tensions in the country are not big enough to stop it, that what God has declared over you, it shall come to pass. I'm God, he says, shall not not bring my word to pass. Everything he spoke over you, it shall, whoo, it shall come to pass. My head is getting hot right now. It shall come to pass. I break every device of the enemy that tried to convince you that you are not what God has called you to be. And we receive it now in Jesus name. Oh, my God. Listen, that's my time. That's my time. I appreciate you being on. I hope I said something to encourage you. Listen, put your energy into something. Retool your life. Get your life together because God is about to release his glory into your life. In Jesus' name. I love you. That's my time. You're a superstar. Thank you for letting me be myself and do what I do, how God does it through me. In Jesus' name. God bless. I'll see you next time.